Good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live from the News Hub. I am Wendy Lai. Coming up this afternoon. Several passengers injured following the derailment of an Accra-bound train from Tema. And we'll tell you how traditional leaders in the Sisala East and West districts have devised sanctions to deter men from marrying and impregnating teenage girls. In business, banks cut interest rates on deposits. And on international fronts, Kenya's chief prosecutor has ordered that the opposition leader, Raila Odinga's sister, should immediately be charged with inciting violence against the Electoral Commission. Start with our stories and an Accra bound train from Tema derailed at Tesano Monday morning, leaving passengers injured. Yes, I was on It's an accident. The cause of the accident is yet to establish. The life of the our brothers and sisters is in safe hand. There's no any serious casualties, as others are saying. But yes, you will carry some injuries. Minor. 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 They can walk, or yes, most of them can walk. So which hospital have they been transferred? Hospital, uh, Atomata Hospital. Atomata Hospital. And some nearby hospital. Somebody cannot be affected now. Or later, somebody can say, I mean, I'm feeling pains here, here and there. There's not too much I can do. I just, my, my first... I think that I asked the station master, I'm, I'm informed that three people, three or four people were injured and they've gone to the hospital. I think this is really a matter for the uh, Railway Development Ministry to, to work on, but I have come because it is in my constituency. I will, I will follow up at the Railway Ministry to find out what has happened. And in your report, accident to Monaco be done. Oh, normally you can feel it may happen, not like this one. We have been recording such incidents periodically, but this is the worst of them. We usually do maintenance of all the rails, yet accidents keep happening. No train will work today. <laughs> So more on the story, and we have been joined by phone, the Accra Real Manager, Acting Real Manager, Abraham Wood. Thanks for agreeing to speak with us, Abraham. Thank you, madam. Now, can you tell us exactly what caused the derailment? Oh, for me, where I stand, it will be too uh, early for me to say what uh, caused the accident. Unless the technical people come to them. Uh, scene of the accident, they can able to tell us the exact cause. But uh, uh, myself, I was on the train. I was on the train. We just left off for Machimota around uh, 7 uh, 40 uh, thereabouts. And uh, just a minute, just away from Achimota station. Then we just said it was the train was just checking to reach Mora, to the driver need to stop. So after that, then we checked. Just looked out and he just saw one of the coaches that just floated. So that is uh, what happened. But the technical team which you've just mentioned, have they been there to assess the situation? Yes, some are there. We are waiting for the rest to join us. And, uh, okay. In the earlier story we played, we heard that about three or four persons were injured. Can you confirm the exact number of injured persons? Uh, yes. 
some got injured. They were uh, man injured. Some of them were complaining of uh, pains at their back and things like that. So I was around. We look for a uh, car for them, and they are, some of them they are at uh, Achimota uh, Hospital. But you don't know the exact number. Oh, uh, we, for me, we, we took uh, four of them to the hospital. Now, there have been issues of slippers. Have um, those issues been resolved? Please come again. There have been issues in the past about slippers. Have those issues been resolved? Issues about slippers? Exactly. Uh -huh. Have those issues been resolved yet? Uh, issues is like a lack of slippers or because you say issues of uh, slippers. Uh, uh, can you... In well, some parts, we've done some stories on railway lines and activities of railways, yes, and some of these matters have come up. That's why I'm asking if generally those issues have been resolved. Oh, yes, we have. You no, know, there, there's a, a factory at Safadi to ask them when, when you need it. We uh, request and they bring it down to, uh, to work with. Even though you've mentioned that the technical team is still working, how quickly can this be resolved? Uh, I'm hoping that by the close of the day, we can be able to uh, uh, put the train back on track. If we don't, then probably tomorrow, early morning, tomorrow, by uh, tomorrow, we have to uh, put the, everything back on track. So, as I, as I, as I said, I'm still at the Achimota station waiting for the rest of the team to join us. And is this the same line that the Nsawam train runs on? Yes, the same line. All right, well, thank you so much. I have been speaking to the acting Accra Rail Manager, Abraham Wood, and we'll bring you some more updates on this very story as and when we get them. You're still watching Midday Live. Traditional leaders have joined forces with parents in the Sicilia East and West areas in the upper West region to devise some bylaws to protect young girls against teenage pregnancy and child marriage. Depending on the degree of the offense, the man would be forced to pay as high as a thousand Ghana cities, in addition to items such as a cow and food. The chiefs and people in the two districts formulated the laws to also improve the not too encouraging level of education there, especially at the basic level. UNICEF statistics says the Upper West region has the third highest child marriage rate with 36.3% after the Upper East and Western regions which top the chart with 39.2% and 36.7% respectively. So some of the sanctions are that um, that's for the Upper West Region. No person should marry or impregnate a girl below the age of 18 years. Now, the sanction is that you pay 500 cities, a cow will be given to the community. On incest, incest is not allowed in the Sisal Latland. If that should happen, um, you pay a sh for a sheep and then 1,000 Ghana cities. And no family should accept any girl below 18 years of age for purposes of marriage into their homes. The sanction is that the person will pay a fine of 500 cities to the community and no chief is supposed to support any case of child marriage or pregnancy. That sanction that follows it is that the chief shall pay 1,000 cities and the sheep to the community. And finally, no teenage um, pregnant girl should be allowed to stay in the boy's family while the boy takes care of the pregnant girl in the areas of provision for food, soap, hospital bills, clothes, etc. This afternoon, to discuss further this very matter, I've been joined in the studio by the Executive Director of Child Rights International, Bright Up Here. Good afternoon, Bright. Good afternoon. Are you surprised? Uh, well, I'm listening not, to I'm this, not, I'm not. I'm not surprised, mm -hmm. and I think there is a very good initiative that the community is looking at uh, to address some of the issues that pertains when it comes to teenage pregnancy and early marriage. So, 
Um, I'm not surprised at all. But, well, but well, I feel there, that... There's some who would argue that um, 500 cities isn't that much, but is it because it's in the Upper West region? Uh, no, because probably the community is also looking at uh, the, the income level of the, each household. Exactly. And I believe that in a rural community, paying 500 Ghana cities is a huge sum of money. Uh, to, to, to look at. So basically, uh, they are just putting in measures to address some of these issues. I, I don't think that the ultimate is, is in the payment of the, of the 500 Ghana cities or the 1,000 Ghana cities that they are talking about, but to put up certain measures to ensure that people desist from that kind of act. So uh, for me, the, 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 the act itself is, is a positive one uh, that we don't have to look at how we can assist. But however you look at it, there are some implications to it when we want to really go into which, which, uh, which uh, the law with respect to how to deal with children. You know, by law, at the age of 16, the law allows certain kind of uh, uh, relations between mm -hmm. a boy and a girl. And uh, beyond that, you cannot, unless it's, you, it's qualified to be a defilement or rape on the basis of that then. But uh, once they're from 16, the law allows certain kind of interaction between a girl and a, and a boy, then you expect that the results is, is obvious, you know. So somebody can challenge that if there's consent in respect to the outcome of it. But also, there's also civil aspect of it that for me the community can also pursue in terms of putting up measures, you know. But once you are slapping a fine on somebody, then you are also going to the detail in terms of the, the legalities. Because once you, a, a person do not give you consent to have sex, then that itself is criminal. Mm -hmm. And where the person also do not do it, you know, out of his own will, then when, and if the person is above 16 years, that also becomes rape, and that is also amount to a criminal case and all that. But if the person engages in that kind of act, and even the person consent to it, and you say that you are slapping the person with a fine, that is, the person can challenge that. But there are also other areas in terms of the, the civil matters that the, the committee can deal with in terms of the arrangement. You know, the arrangement has nothing to do with, with, with criminal matters, but it is, it's a civil case that the community can also pursue. So if the community says that you should not allow the boy child to stay with the man who impregnated the girl, I think that they, they, they are right and they can take that decision. And then where you'd also stop that because the girl is pregnant and you cannot engage the girl in certain activities, mm -hmm. the community is also right in respect to no, that and all. But you have commended this step. You've touched on income levels, you've touched on the civil bit and some other aspects as well. But is this deterrent enough? Are there other ways of going about this to prevent some of these pointers I've mentioned here? Yeah, of course, of course. There are, there are so many ways that you can look at it. But I think that to the best of the knowledge of the community, they feel that this is be, uh, the best way forward. We, we will be discussing it here and may not be, a, be deterrent enough. But when you move to a rural community, paying 500 Ghana cities is a huge sum of money, you know. So even if you ask the community to pay 10 Ghana cities, it's a huge sum of money for them to do that. So I think that it's the whole concept is what I'm looking at, that they putting in something in place to ensure that people uh, do not take advantage of children. So at least if you see a child walking by in the community, you'll, you'll be careful in terms of how you want to engage a child and all that. So I'm basically looking at a concept that they are, they are introducing. And once the, it is a bylaw uh, which do not conflict with the, any, any supreme law. I don't think that uh, they are doing the wrong thing. I think that they are on the right path, and we need to encourage them. And if there is anybody in the community who understands the position of the law, you should also advise them so that they don't pass, they don't make bylaws. That would also conflict with the, the bigger law that we have in respect to how we deal with children and the things that we have to do uh, to, uh, for them. Yeah, thank you so much for thank your you time. Too. I have been speaking to Executive Director, Child Rights International by Tapia. We're grateful. You're still watching Media Live. Thanks for staying. The newly installed Gamanche Nita Kite Kochu says that his kinship is not politically motivated as he is the rightful person to the throne. I do have my colleague Komla Kuchi who's been following the story closely to give us some updates on his installation and then our drawing as well. Hello Komla. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Colonel. Now, earlier when I spoke to you, you mentioned that he has already been outdoored, but tell us about the mood there now. 
2020, the mood was that of a jubilant one. You see, most of the people in the Gazette thronged uh, the palace uh, uh, located at the North Chinese area. Several people were there. But Wendy, I mean, you can see the joy uh, on their faces. A lot of them expressing the joy that, well, after all these years, finally they have somebody who would be their king, somebody who would lead them, somebody who will stand in the capacity as the rightful uh, 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 person to lead the Ghana state for them to be able to have the rightful development that they deserve. Another bit was um, tight security. Is that still the same as we speak? Wendy, it's, it's been like that for the past three or four days from the school house in Gamashi, uh, which we reported over the weekend with a huge security, the police with their armored vehicles and then uh, fully armed to the teeth. The same thing was replicated at the palace this morning. You can see them here, uh, fully armed. Uh, I, I can count not less than 20 of them fully armed in their uh, uh, vehicle as well, positioned here. One other thing that has been happening is that the, the, the kingmaker, who is a justice, he has been speaking and saying that the Ghana state has not been happy about the protracted conflict or, or uh, misunderstanding that has rocked the state. He has rendered them without a leader for so long a time. As it stands now, once that once uh, uh, the newly installed government, uh, Ni Saki Tekutu, the second has been installed, then he thinks that this is the end of the protracted conflict or the protracted uh, misunderstanding that has worked the state. He is hopeful that after all of this, uh, one thing would be paramount, development of the people. He was also very emphatic to say that it is because of, of corruption and, and, and uh, 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 some ill faith to a very large extent that has made the Ghana state without a leader all these years. But this has brought an end to all of the conflict. All right. Well, thank you so much, Komla Kluche. There, and he's been following up the story. We'll bring you some more in our subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Midday Live. The chief of the Diyoko in the Busum district, Nana E.J. Penny, is calling on the government to assist in the expansion of an oil mill factory in the community as part of a one district, one factory project. This, he said, will reduce the high unemployment rate in the area. The chief and people of the Duyako in the Ashanti region in 2016 released over 100 acres of land to a private Ghanaian investor to put up a vegetable oil extraction company. The move was to enhance the economic activities in the area and also create employment to the residents. The factory is currently giving direct employment to about 80 people, but the chief of the Diyako wants the government to assist the factory to expand to enable it to employ more people. Raw materials, no, or to free a stream. Sabai ko ko boa akuya phonea. Amo muti mi produce a soya beans no more. He buys the raw materials up north. That means should assist farmers in the northern region. The chief executive officer of Vesta Oil Mills, Kwesinia Mitchell, stressed on how difficult it is for agro businesses to secure a loan facility. He said government facilitation of loans to them will enable them to expand their business and employ more. We have a lot of outgrower schemes out there with plenty of farmers. You know, the, we have smallholder farmers with four, four acres, five acres, ten acres, and they all feed into um, our operations because currently we're doing 40 tons a day. We'll be happy if government will um, assist us in the way of funding. Um, we're not saying government should give us money for free, uh, but we want some flexible kind of arrangement. 
Vesta Oil Mills is a vegetable oil extraction company processing mainly soya bean and palm kernel oil. The company is also working towards producing fish and poultry feed. We head to the central region. After narrowly escaping death from the collapse of their classroom block, kindergarten pupils at Bonsangu DA School in the Etimokwa district are struggling to hold classes. Pupils study without a board and have inadequate furniture. story shortly but remember you can get interactive send your comments on our social media platforms facebook and twitter as news on tv3 we have that story now time was up for pupils at bonsa Hodie school to say the lord's prayer and pledge to be faithful to ghana but attendance was poor for several reasons lessons had begun but pupils in this class study in fear that the weak building put up many years ago could come down at any time to claim lives and halt academics. At the beginning of this academic year, about 50 kindergarten one and two pupils narrowly escaped death when their classroom block collapsed before school hours. School authorities have improvised a structure for the children to have classes. However, Furniture and writing boards are unavailable for the combined class, forcing the school authority to stop KG2 pupils from bringing books to school. For about a month now, these pupils come to school every day to learn and revise poems. The dusty nature of the classroom is the reason, and this puts a question on the provision of quality education for all. Teachers speaking off camera said if the situation persists, it will take time for the kids to pick up. The chief of Bonsa Honana Pia could be recounted. Some teachers who are unable to face the challenges of the school leave the community, leaving the kids to their fate. Old students of Bonsa Hundi A school are therefore calling on authorities to consider their constitutional mandate of providing equal rights to educational opportunities and facilities for all. Still in the community, we look at access to portable water. The farming community, with a population of about 800, is made up of people from different parts of the country living together. One major setback hindering the progress of this community is the lack of potable water. In the late 90s, the Jerry Rollins-led government provided them with a solar-operated borehole, which parts were reportedly stolen. But this has since not been attended to by successive governments. Residents here do not miss any opportunity to harvest rainwater for domestic chores, but are forced to trek several miles to get water during dry seasons. Access to portable drinking water has been a challenge for years. We are appealing to government to provide us with portable drinking water. Sustainable Development Goal number 6 promotes access to potable water for all by 2030. 13 years more to 2030 and this is the only source of drinking water for over 800 people. Now, students come here every day to get water to the school before lessons begin. We're speaking with one of the students. So why are you getting water from here and what we are you going to use for? We are going to use to drink in the school. Because if we do not come and fetch water from here and go and drink, we cannot get any water in the school to drink. Several attempts to reach the district chief executive on the issue proved futile. Spencer Kobnabot in Mensa, TV2 News, Chifubon Sahon. And today we begin our disability series. We bring you a news item on how basketball is helping persons living with disability overcome their challenges. Disability is not an ability. Here I am. I'm, I'm a star. 
and uh, with this sports team, uh, basketball, basketball, I make me uh, move around the world, and I have learned a lot. When I was uh, 18 months old, and through my mother's I mean, story that they gave me, she said I was I was attacked by polio. Ah. You know, when it comes to able bodies, before they will shoot, they have to jump before. But to the stand that you can sit in the wheelchair and, and basket, I didn't know that there was something like that so when I got here. A person with disability in my situation like this, at least you have to I mean, access your body, first of all. By accessing your body, at least you'll be, you'll be, you'll, 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 you can live long and you will not become weak and weaker. At least you can I stretch your, your because mostly some of us who are in this situation that we are don't normally exercise that but they easily grow old. I normally stay at the corner there. You know, I, I don't rush on the ball. The moment the ball comes to my end, I have to make good use of it. That's why they normally call me one corner. So for more on the disability series, don't miss Media Live during the week. The president of the Diabetes Association of Ghana, AC Dunye, has rubbished corruption allegations leveled against her in the diversion of insulin meant for children with diabetes. My colleague Josephine Frimpong joins us shortly and live from a news conference which is being organized on this very issue. We've never sold insulin meant for children in Ghana before. It has always been free. And we haven't diverted insulin meant for children for adults. Insulin men for adults are different. Insulin men from adults are procured but free. So it goes at a subsidized price. And the association has several channels of getting insulin. They want to tarnish my reputation because they haven't had, their, they haven't had it easy with me. I don't condone corruption. We'll bring you more of that story in our subsequent bulletins. This is Media Life. Thanks for staying. Tension is mounting at Tema PSC shipyard over the activities of two rival unions that represent the star. The problem, if not resolved, could spark labor unrest at the country's port as the two unions, Maritime and Dock Workers Union and Port Seamen, Maritime and Dockers Union, are at each other's throat. The two rivalry unions are the Port Seamen Maritime Dockers Union and the Maritime Dock Workers Union of the TUC. The Maritime and Dock Workers Union of the TUC have been agitating for the removal of the managing director, Captain Francis Micah, of the PSC shipyard. But the leadership of the senior staff union of GPHE, who are members of the Maritime Dock Workers Union of the TUC disagrees. In an unstable environment, as a result of disturbances in labor fronts, there is no way productivity can be attained. That the chief executive and the HR of the shipyard be moved, we found it very unfortunate. Appeals have been made to the Transport Ministry to intervene and restore calm. The Ghana Foods and Drugs Authority has impounded some cartons of unwholesome chicken at the Temaport. Reports indicate the unconfirmed amount of chicken made its way into the country through the Temaport. 
Airport. James Latte is a peer manager of the Food and Drugs Authority and he joins me via phone. Good afternoon, James. Yeah, good afternoon, Wendy. Now, can you confirm the quantity of cartons of the chicken impounded? In the first place, let me explain that uh, the chicken was legally imported into the country. Mm. We need to establish that. So it wasn't something like that was illegally imported and we impounded on them. No, okay. it was legally imported. But what happened was that when they got to the port and one container was open, it was noted to have some stench in it and some odor was coming out of it. So we had to place a detention notice on it, send it to the owner's warehouse, and then do a sorting. So it was that during the sorting that we realized that 266 cuttings of the product had come back. That had been destroyed last Monday. That was exactly a week ago today that the 266 cuttings were destroyed. And the remaining, that is, uh, the, it, the, the whole container contained 1,008, 2,800 cuttings. And we destroyed just 266. The remaining ones, samples were taken by veterinary services to their laboratory for confirmation whether they are good to be consumed. Well, the results indicated that there was no problem with them. There was another consignment that was noticed also later. We currently placed a detention notice on that one too, waiting for laboratory results. So this is the situation at the moment. So is the one that were checked and confirmed to be okay already on the market? No, it is not yet. None of the prologue is yet on the market. They are at the owner's warehouse, which we have placed detention notice on. And is the FDA going to monitor these cartons? Yes, we will. We will. Our officers have been going there almost on a daily basis to confirm that the products are intact. So okay. the investigation is ended. All right. Well, thank you so much, James Alati. He's a PR manager for the Food and Drugs Authority. We'll be following this story as well. That's all for business this afternoon. Contestants heaved a sigh of relief as judges spared them again. I declare tonight's conviction free. <laughs> All six contestants took the audience on a journey of festivals related to the various regions. While some had a difficult time getting through with their performance, others swept both judges and the public off their feet. Regions Sewa definitely had an amazing night as she came through with a triple threat, grabbing all awards of the night. They were most disciplined, most eloquent, and overall star performer of the night. However, after Central Regions Baba, one of the most consistent contestants in the competition, failed to deliver a smooth performance following an accident encountered during her rehearsal. The judges insisted the competition must go on. They said regardless of whatever happens, the onus lies on the delegates to do their best. As a performer, things happen, but you should be able to remove yourself from that. That makes you a good performer. You know, so we still give their marks according to what they did, including Baba. The judges stated the remaining weeks which will be the road to the final would require an extra effort and an X-Factor performance to crown the winner. Where we have reached, I think the girls have had enough time uh, to get used to performing on stage. Um, and so there shouldn't be any excuses. You can't come and do uh, kindergarten performances, uh, you know, and walk away with a 4 by 4 Ghana's Most Beautiful 2017, straight out of Ghana. And though the show started after 10 p.m. instead of the scheduled time, which is 8, patrons got the worth of their money. Patrons stood on their feet to enjoy various performances by different artists. Meanwhile, xylophone media signees Kumi Gita and Obibini Buafo were exempted from the performance. 
another report by Ajom Fosse. After over two hours of lateness and an almost half empty auditorium, Becca gave her fans an epic moment to remember. The Dark Da Superstars concert, which looked dull from the beginning, picked up after a couple of performances. It was characterized by back to back performances comprising old and new tracks of hers. Becca brought on A-listers from both Nigeria and Ghana to share in the celebration. The likes of rap guru Sarkodie, M.I. and Ice Prince did not disappoint the crowd. Dancehall magicians Shatawale and Stoneboy, as always, took fans to another level of performance. <laughs> Pop hit makers the one calls Mr. Easy and Pat Rankin stage act almost brought the roof of the National Theatre down. <laughs> Former first lady Nedwajman Rollins stole the show halfway. <laughs> However, the surprise act of the night, BET award winner Whiskit, set the whole place on fire when he jumped on stage out of the blue to entertain audience. <laughs> Though a great night, audience were disappointed as they expected xylophones Kumigita and Ubibini to add their performances to the ninth tour list as had been advertised but that did not happen and that's all for the news this afternoon but we have more programs coming up shortly my name is Wendy Lai enjoy the rest of the afternoon